In this video, I'll discuss how a firm undertakes an IPO. Then I'll discuss the secondary market and the stock exchanges, and then finally I'll discuss market regulation and trading innovations. As I mentioned in the last video, there are many reasons why a firm's management and shareholders would want to undertake an IPO. So let's talk about how that process happens. Initially, the board will sign off on the IPO. This will often happen either when the board itself votes to undertake the IPO, or when the firm's CEO recommends an IPO. How that decision is made will depend on the firm. Regardless of who decides that the firm needs to proceed with an IPO, the firm will seek out an investment banker to sell their new shares to their clients. In many cases, the IPO will be large enough that the investment banker will need other banks to join in when issuing shares to their clients. When a group of investment banks undertakes an IPO, this is referred to as the syndicate, but there is always going to be at least one lead investment bank. The investment bank or syndicate's job is to put together the prospectus, which is the document that details every piece of value-relevant information about the firm that's selling its shares to the public. The prospectus is also known as the S1 statement, or the red herring. Historically, this was referred to as the red herring because prospectuses that were missing their price and number of shares offered had red corners, indicating that they were incomplete. The term red herring is less common nowadays. The prospectus gives prospective investors information about the firm that's trying to sell its shares to the public. Notice that the areas for share price and amount raised are blank. These will be filled in after the third step, the roadshow. The roadshow is the firm's chance to meet with the clients of the investment bank or syndicate around the world. Their goal is to create interest in those investors, so the firm and a representative of the investment bank will travel around the world and meet with those clients. They'll answer questions from iBank clients, and if everything goes well, the clients will give the firm and the investment bank some indication of how much they'd be willing to pay for shares and how many shares they'd want. This is why the roadshow is often referred to as book building. The firm and iBanking syndicate are gauging interest and after the roadshow, they'll determine the number of shares they can sell and at what price. If they decide to undertake the IPO, they'll set the price and sell a certain number of shares to the syndicate's clients. If they decide there isn't enough interest and they can't raise an appropriate amount of cash from the sale, they'll cancel the IPO. The next step is to set the price in the S1 statement, which, when completed, is called the registration statement. And then the firm and its investment banking syndicate will send that information to the SEC for review. If the SEC does not ask for revisions to the registration statement, the firm will sell the shares to the syndicate's clients for the same price. Part of the cash raised will be used to pay the investment bank's fee. The fee is often referred to as flotation costs, and historically the flotation costs for an IPO are around 7% of the cash raised. So, as you can see, in this IPO, where Goldman Sachs undertakes its IPO in the late 90s, Goldman is listing its shares for $53, and it's raising about $3.6 or $3.7 billion. And everything that you could ever want to know about Goldman Sachs as a company is going to be listed here. So, who they are, why they're going public, some balance sheet and income statement, information later in this document. The registration statement and prospectus will also give some risks and how the, mon how the firm makes its money. Literally every piece of value relevant information about the firm undertaking an IPO needs to be in here. So these things can be hundreds of pages long. Once the shares are distributed to the clients of the investment bank, they'll start to trade on the exchange the firm has contracted to allow shareholders to buy and sell shares, like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. For example, I just showed you SNAP's prospectus. SNAP's shares trade on the NASDAQ, while Goldman's shares from its 1999 IPO are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. The final step in this process is the lockup period expiration. The lockup period refers to the period when shareholders who held shares prior to the IPO are prevented from selling their shares, and you can probably see why this exists. If these early investors were allowed to liquidate their positions on the first day of trading, then their trades could lead to a significant decrease in the share price, 
and cause prospective investors in the secondary market to hesitate from buying. So typically, they can't sell their shares for about six months after the IPO. Now, there's a lot of other parts to IPOs that I haven't covered, and we could spend an entire month on the subject and just barely scratch the surface. There are IPOs that involve shelf registration, where the firm doesn't sell all of the new shares, but instead keeps some shares and sells those shares to new investors at some point in the next two years. We can have all kinds of other characteristics of IPOs. Let's talk a little more about investment banks, or iBanks. Their primary role is to underwrite and sell securities of firms to their clients. Investment banks can create almost any type of security, including bonds, stocks, and preferred stock. When a firm issues stock, it's always going to have at least one lead investment banker or lead underwriter, and that lead underwriter is going to organize the syndicate. That syndicate, each of those banks will have a, a number of clients. So large investors, large retail investors, maybe there will be some institutional investors. And in the IPO, the investment banker will sell shares to those clients. Since the 1980s, the standard compensation for the syndicate, as I've mentioned, has been about 7% of the cash raised. When an iBank oversees an IPO, there are two ways it can sell the shares. The first way it can sell those shares to its clients is the best efforts method. Now, the best efforts method involves the iBank giving its best efforts to sell the shares to its clients. Any shares that can't be sold are not issued. The second method that we'll talk about here is the firm commitment method. And this is a bit more risky for the investment bank. It involves the members of the syndicate, the, the actual investment banks, buying all the shares and then selling them to their clients. Any shares that are not sold to their clients are held in the investment bank's portfolio. Now, as you can imagine, this method is far more risky for the investment bank. And because of that, anytime you see that an investment bank is underwriting a new security using the firm commitment method, that IPO is likely to outperform another IPO that's being undertaken using the best efforts method. Now let's take a look at an actual IPO, Facebook's IPO. As you're aware, Facebook is a publicly traded company. It became a publicly traded firm in 2012, and here's how it happened. In early 2012, Facebook was working with its syndicate, which included JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. This syndicate put out an S1 statement on February 1st of 2012. Then Mark Zuckerberg and the members of the syndicate began the roadshow. So they went to places like Denver, Colorado, probably a couple of cities outside of the U.S., and they gauged the interest of their syndicate's clients. Now what they found is that demand for Facebook shares was so strong and the price that investment banking clients were willing to pay was so high that they decided to actually issue 25% more shares than they originally expected or were originally specified. They set their share price also above their initial range or their expected range of share prices. Then they drew up their final prospectus or registration statement on May 18th of 2012, issued those shares, and those shares started to trade. Now, this was up until this time the largest tech IPO in history, and on the first day of trading, Facebook's shares appreciated in value by 23 cents or 0.6% or 60 basis points. We'll talk about why that's important in a second. The final step occurred when Facebook's lockup period expired on August 16th, 2012. So that meant that the early shareholders like Mark Zuckerberg could sell their shares to the public, whereas in this period from May to August, they couldn't. They were in the lockup period. Now, I just mentioned that first day of trading or that return on the first day of trading. Let's talk about why that's important. Now, management of a firm that's undertaking an IPO doesn't want the price of shares to fall. The good news is that historically, the one-day return is, on average, 15% across all time periods, industries, and countries. In other words, shares that start out worth $100 at 9.30 a.m. when the markets open on the first day of trading for a new security will, on average, be worth $115 by the end of trading 
This large one-day return phenomenon is referred to as IPO underpricing because shares are clearly priced below the price the market is willing to pay for the shares. However, the amount of underpricing is not consistent across IPOs. I took this data from Jay Ritter, who's arguably the world's leading academic authority on IPOs. As you can see, the stock of tech firms during the dot-com bubble was heavily underpriced. Notice that the mean underpricing of IPOs of mature firms during the 1980s was only 3.8%. So what's going on here? Why is underpricing so high for certain IPOs, but so low for others? There are several reasons noted by researchers. I believe the most likely is that IPOs are risky. If a manager is going to incentivize clients of an iBank to buy shares of a stock that's young or hasn't turned a regular profit, then they're likely going to have to underprice those shares to the point that those iBanking clients will be willing to buy those shares. Therefore, the riskier the security, the greater the amount of underpricing. So as you can see here, internet and tech stocks historically have had a greater amount of underpricing than, say, mature firms or mature I firms that undertake IPOs, like Goldman Sachs, which would be in this group here. Non-internet and non-tech stocks don't perform especially well on their first day of trading. Internationally, a lot of stocks in China actually see huge amounts of underpricing or huge one-day returns. If you want to see that, just take a look at our appendix slides. There are two other explanations for IPO underpricing that I'll mention here. First, there are several researchers who have hypothesized that the firm is compensating investors for specifying their level of interest. The argument here is that the firm's management is incentivizing the institutional investors that buy these shares to give up their private information. The compensation would need to be higher for these riskier securities. In other words, it's a compensation story. Another possibility is that the firm is underpricing the issue to quote-unquote leave a good taste in investors' mouths. The argument here is that the firm might need to issue a secondary equity offering, which occurs when the firm issues more shares of the stock to raise cash after the IPO. If the firm left a good taste in investors' mouths during the IPO, aka investors earned a large return, then they should be more likely to buy shares of a secondary equity offering, or SEO. Now, there's less empirical evidence to support this theory. The firm might never issue an SEO, or it might issue sh new shares very far in the future. As you can tell, I think the first theory, the risk story, makes the most sense. IPOs are risky and therefore require greater compensation for investors. Once a firm issues shares, those shares will begin to trade on an exchange. There are two types of investors that are most likely to buy or sell those shares. First, we have individual or retail investors. You and I are individual or retail investors. We set up brokerage accounts with a broker dealer like TD Ameritrade, which allows us to deposit money in an account and then buy shares with the amount we've deposited. At the same time, broker dealers operate in this space. As their name implies, a broker dealer serves a dual role. First, they fill the role of a broker by taking orders from clients to buy and sell securities and matching those orders with other open orders. Their other role is to act as a dealer or market maker. In this role, they buy and sell securities on their own behalf in an attempt to make a profit. Most of the brokers you've ever heard of, like TD Ameritrade, are both brokers and dealers. To simplify their title, we just call them brokers. Now let's talk about the exchanges where stocks trade. As a disclaimer, what I'm about to discuss is a topic called market microstructure, which refers to the structure of the market and how securities are traded in that market. One of the things you should know about market microstructure is that it can change rapidly. In fact, since the first time I taught this class in 2016 at Indiana State University, the terminology has changed a few times. Keep in mind that if you're a junior now, the microstructure of the exchanges could change by the time you graduate. All right, let's get started, and I'll try to keep things a little vague. Now, the first market that we have here is the New York Stock Exchange. It's one of the oldest stock exchanges in the U.S. and historically has had a trading floor. 
To be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, a firm has to maintain a share price of at least $2 to $3 and have a market cap or market capitalization of at least $40 million. If you want to see the specific listing requirements, go ahead and click this hyperlink right here. Historically, the New York Stock Exchange, or NYSE, is where the most prestigious firms list their shares. GE, Berkshire Hathaway, and Coca-Cola all list their shares on the NYSE. In addition to floor traders, NYSE employs an online system called Super Display Book. If you've ever seen a picture like this, you've likely seen the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. A designated market maker sits at each of these individual stations. The designated market maker, or DMM, is in charge of creating liquidity for one specific stock. They handle large orders and keep track of the order book. If an institutional investor wants to buy, let's say, a million dollars worth of shares of Ford, or let's say, just to make it simpler, a million shares of Ford, they're probably going to buy it on the floor of the exchange. The other way shares trade on the NYSE is electronically. The DMM also serves as the firm's point of contact if the firm wants to find out the mood of investors. Let's say they're, they're planning an SEO and they want to gauge investor interest. They'll talk to the DMM. In addition to the floor traders, the NYSE employs an online system called Super Display Book. This is a server-based system where brokers can trade their shares on their own or the client's behalf without having to be on the floor of the exchange. So let's take a look at how this works. So I've already mentioned the floor of the exchange. That's where the DMM sits. And if you've ever seen videos of the New York Stock Exchange, you'll see brokers surrounding the DMM trying to place orders to buy and sell shares. Each of those brokers or broker dealers probably has at least a few retail investors or institutional investors that are their clients. So they're buying and selling shares on behalf of their clients. Now, in addition to the floor of the exchange, which is this left side of the chart I created, poorly, I might add, uh, we also have the super display book. So this is, this is where the shares trade electronically on the internet. So you have brokers connected to the super display book, which historically has been called many things, including super dot, but you don't really need to know that. Uh, so these brokers, again, they have clients who might be retail investors or other institutional investors, and they submit orders to their broker. Broker places the order on the dis on Super Display Book if they can't fill that order directly with their own shares, and then that order will be matched up with orders of, let's say, another client of another broker, assuming the, the prices match up. The next exchange we need to discuss is the NASDAQ, which was created in 1975, so a lot more recently. Because it's newer, it's unsurprisingly more modern. The NASDAQ lists about 3,000 stocks right now. Just like the NYSE, firms choose to list their shares on the NASDAQ. A firm will choose between the NYSE or the NASDAQ, but won't list on both. The reason they'll choose only one of these exchanges is because the firm has to pay an annual fee to the exchange for its shares to trade there. The NASDAQ primarily hosts the stock of tech firms and smaller firms. Firms like Google and Apple both list their shares on the NASDAQ. The big difference between the NYSE and the NASDAQ is that there's no trading floor for the NASDAQ. All trades occur online. So let's take a look at how the NASDAQ works. So like I said, this is all happening essentially on the NASDAQ server. So you have the NASDAQ, which officially is headquartered in New York, but its primary server is in a small town in New Jersey. And just like with the NYSE, the NASDAQ will have a number of brokers linked into the exchange, and each of those brokers is going to have a series of clients. We'll say they're retail investors, but they're probably going to have some institutional investors as clients. A retail investor that wants to, let's say, buy 100 shares of Ford or a round lot, they'll submit that order to their broker. If their broker can't fill that order with their own shares, they'll send that order to the NASDAQ server, and potentially one of the other brokers or clients of a broker will be interested in selling 100 shares of Ford for the appropriate price. And if so, that order will clear. In other words, you get to buy your 100 shares from, let's say, this client over here who gets to sell their 100 shares for the agreed-upon price. 
Now, there are other exchanges besides the NASDAQ and the NYSE, both inside and outside the U.S. Inside the U.S., there are regional exchanges like the Boston Stock Exchange, Miami Stock Exchange, and Philadelphia Stock Exchange. In recent years, many of these exchanges have been acquired by the NASDAQ or the NYSE Euronext. For example, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange is now known as NASDAQ OMX PHLX, in other words, the Philadelphia NASDAQ. NYSE Euronext is the firm that owns the New York Stock Exchange. It was formed when the New York Stock Exchange acquired the European Stock Exchange Euronext in 2007. There are also exchanges that allow the trading of options. The biggest of these is the CBO, or Chicago Board Options Exchange. In addition to the CBO, many of the exchanges acquired by the NASDAQ also trade options, and they can also trade futures contracts, but we'll come to that. Uh, the largest futures exchange is run by the CME Group, which is the organization that has acquired many old futures exchanges like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, the New York Mercantile Exchange, and the Commodity Exchange. In other words, the market for futures contracts is dominated by the C CME Group. You can visit their website and see everything that they trade. Now let's talk about alternative trading systems or as they're also known, Electronic Communication Networks, or ECNs. Now, ECNs, or Alternative Trading Systems, are trading venues that function like exchanges, but don't exercise regulatory authority over their subscribers. Essentially, they're a way for many investors to submit orders from a trading platform without having to be at a physical exchange. Almost any broker that offers a trading platform is giving their clients access to one of these alternative trading systems. If you've ever used TD Ameritrade's Thinkorswim platform, you'll note that you have the ability to buy and sell securities directly on this platform. Any order you place on the Thinkorswim platform from TD Ameritrade is going to be transmitted directly to TD Ameritrade and they'll actually fill the order or send it out to the actual exchange. Now these platforms, they allow retail investors like you and me to mostly submit limit orders, which we'll talk about in a couple of videos. Uh, but limit orders are where you specify the most that you're willing to pay or the least that you're willing to sell your shares at. Now, whether you get to buy shares depends on the limit price that you submit, and it also depends on the speed with which the order travels to the server. Electronic communication networks, or ECNs, are used primarily for trading stocks and currency. All right, now I have to talk about something that's a little less interesting, market regulation. So you need to know something about each of these laws that I've listed here and on the next slide in order to understand how the securities markets operate. I'll do my best to put them in context, but as you're probably aware, there's a lot more big pieces of legislation besides what I'm showing you now. So you're probably at least a little familiar with market regulation, and you've probably heard of the SEC or Securities Exchange Commission. Uh, the SEC is the organization in the U.S. that oversees the security markets. The SEC sets regulations and examines cases of insider trading and fraud. However, this wasn't always the case. Prior to the 1930s, there was almost no regulation governing the information that needed to be reported publicly or accurately to investors by firms when their shares are trading on an exchange. In the 1920s, securities regulations were decided at the state level. One problem with this is that some states had more lax regulations than other states, and firms found that they could sell shares across state lines easily. As you know, there was a market crash starting in 1929. A commission was set up in 1932 called the Pecora Commission, and it found widespread evidence of conflicts of interest, inaccurate information about the securities that were being traded, and many cases of just outright fraud in the run-up to the crisis. As a result, Congress passed the Securities Act of 1933, which required the full disclosure of information by companies to investors. All securities were also required to be registered with the FTC, or the Federal Trade Commission. Congress also passed something called the Glass-Steagall Act in the same year, which broke up banking operations. This act 
did a lot of things, but one of the most important things it did was it prevented brokers, commercial banks, and investment banks from engaging in each other's operations. This means that investment banks and investment companies could no longer take deposits from customers. Uh, it This act also created the FDIC and federal deposit insurance. This is why if your bank fails today, your deposits are up, are insured up to a certain amount. That amount used to be 250000 uh, It's increased to 400000 in the last couple of years. The following year, Congress passed the Securities Exchange Act, which actually created the SEC and invested it with the power to regulate the buying and selling of securities. The act also allows the SEC to investigate securities fraud and insider trading, which occur when a corporate insider profits from their knowledge of private firm information. The act also gives the SEC the power to oversee brokerage firms, transfer agents, and clearing agencies, as well as self-regulatory agencies or organizations like the NASDAQ and, and the NYSE. In other words, the SEC has broad power to oversee just about every aspect of the markets. From the 1930s to the 1990s, the U.S. financial industry was fragmented and the banking industry was regulated at the state level. Banks were heavily restricted from operating branches across state borders. However, a movement in the late 1980s for deregulation eventually broke this down. In the 1980s, many politicians began pushing for market deregulation. In the early 1990s, the regal Neal Banking Act allowed commercial banks to operate across state borders, while the Financial Services Modernization Act, also known as the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, essentially allowed brokers, investment banks, and commercial banks to engage in each other's operations. In other words, this act, the Financial Services Modernization Act, repealed part of the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, which was designed to prevent another Great Depression. After this act was passed in 1999, the rapid mergers and increases in both bank size and complexity was one of the major contributors to the 2008 financial crisis. Many investment banks like Goldman Sachs reclassified themselves as commercial banks, while others like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns purchased large amounts of risky securities like mortgage-backed securities. When it became apparent that these mortgage-backed securities were highly overvalued, the banks that purchased them began to take write-downs on their balance sheets. The write-downs decreased the value of the assets the bank owned and led to low book value of equity and high debt-to-equity ratios. Bear Stearns was actually able to be acquired by J.P. Morgan Chase, but Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail. This failure by Lehman Brothers is often seen as the start of the 2008 financial crisis, but the issues that caused Lehman and Bear to fail were present for years in most of the large investment banks. Deregulation allowed these banks to engage in riskier activities and hold riskier assets than they'd previously been allowed to hold. And that brings me to the Dodd-Frank Act. Now, the Dodd-Frank Act was developed to correct many of the problems made evident by the 2008 financial crisis. The bill saw the creation of the CFPB, or Consumer Fran Financial Protection Bureau, which is tasked with protecting consumers in the financial sector. In the past, the CFPB has set maximum interest rates on credit cards and addressed grievances from consumers. The act also created the Financial Stability Oversight Council and the Office of Financial Research. Now, the FSOC, or FSOC for short, this thing right here, is tasked with identifying risks to the financial stability of the United States. The council consists of 10 voting member agencies and 5 non-voting member agencies. The goal of the FSOC is to essentially get together and identify threats to the financial system before they happen and take actions to prevent that from happening. Now, their operations are supported by the Office of Financial Research. The Office of Financial Research provides financial data to the FSOC to guide its decisions and the decisions of its member agencies. In other words, these two agencies work in tandem to head off any future financial crises and the damaging effects to the U.S. economy that would result from said crises. Now, I think it's time 
for me to highlight a couple of interesting innovations taking place in financial markets today. The first innovation I want to talk about is dark pools. And dark pools are trading networks for broker dealers that are not connected to the main exchange. In this chart, I've added a dark pool to the NASDAQ. As you can see, three market participants are able to trade with each other in this dark pool. So this retail investor, this broker, and this retail investor over here. There are several reasons why dark pools would be created. The biggest one is that they preserve the anonymity of the buyers and sellers of the securities in the pool, which is an advantage for institutions that want to trade and make very large orders. For example, let's say Carl Icahn, who's a hedge fund manager and a well-known corporate raider, has identified an undervalued firm and wants to buy the majority stake of the firm's shares. If he uses the NASDAQ to purchase shares from retail investors in large quantities, smart investors will recognize that he, or at least someone, is buying up a lot of shares and will probably try to acquire a majority stake in that company. If they can buy shares before Icon, he'll likely have to buy those shares from them at a premium. A dark pool allows Carl Icahn to buy a large percentage of the shares outstanding with some degree of anonymity. The next trading innovation I want to discuss is algorithmic trading. Algorithmic trading is an automated way of trading. Algorithmic trading is used for several reasons. An algorithm can process new information and trade on the information in a fraction of a second, which is beneficial if a firm needs to be the first to use some new information. Algorithmic trading can also be used to trade based on complicated formulas that are created by quants or quantitative analysts. Essentially, algorithmic trading just involves an algorithm being written to make trades. The benefit here is that once you write the algorithm, your profit will depend upon the quality of your algorithm. However, if there's an error in your code or the trading strategy you believe will allow you to beat the market doesn't work, you could find yourself losing a very large amount of money very quickly. The final innovation I want to mention here is high frequency trading. High frequency traders are algorithmic traders whose goal is to be the first to trade on some new piece of information. They accomplish this by using fast computers and maintaining servers that are close to the server running the exchange. For example, the NASDAQ server is in Mawa, New Jersey. Many high frequency traders locate their servers as close as they can to that server so that their orders will have a shorter, a shorter latency time or travel time. In this example, Broker 1's server is in Chicago, Illinois, while Broker 2's server is in New York, New York. Now let's say both brokers create an algorithm to download and analyze the text of the Federal Reserve's beige book when it's uploaded at 2 p.m. on the day that it's posted. When the beige book is posted, the information it contains indicates that U.S. economic conditions are worse than expected. Both of these brokers would have an algorithm to analyze the text of the beige book and then automatically trade shares. So in this case, they'd probably want to sell some shares before everyone else. They're going to submit orders to sell those shares before other investors do. Uh, the problem here is that Broker 2 is closer to the server than Broker 1. This means that Broker 2's order will arrive ahead of Broker 1's, unless there's something very wrong with the system. Uh, so Broker 2, assuming they're submitting the same trades or same orders, just this one comes ahead of this one, uh, in this case, Broker 2 will get to sell their shares before Broker 1 will. Now, while there might not be a large return based on beige book information, in 2017, it was estimated that high-frequency traders initiate somewhere between 10 and 20% of the trading volume of equities on the NASDAQ. So in other words, even if they're not making a large amount of money on each trade, high-frequency traders are making a huge percentage of the trades. All right. Let's recap. So I started off this section by mentioning that IPOs are historically underpriced on average. Uh, that's just a well-known phenomenon. IPO underpricing is historically been about 15%, although it 
differs depending on time period and uh, the market that we're talking about. If you want to see some additional breakdowns of IPO underpricing across markets, go ahead and take a look at the appendix slides. Now, another thing you should know is that most of the volume of shares traded in the U.S. is done via stock exchanges, like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Those are the big two in the U.S., and the New York Stock Exchange is actually the biggest exchange in terms of dollar value traded in the entire world. Now, although there are many exchanges around the world, most of those exchanges are going to be like the NASDAQ. They're going to allow investors to trade electronically. Most invest, uh, most exchanges don't actually have a trading floor like the New York Stock Exchange has his historically had. And finally, you should know that the regulation of financial markets has tended to swing throughout history. So prior to the 1930s, we saw very lax regulation of the markets. And then from the 30s to the 90s, markets were fairly well regulated. And then starting in the mid to late 90s, we saw a general deregulation of financial markets. All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. If not, I will see you on the next video.